The pressure of a price tag. Michael Clark on Mitchell Stark's expensive start in the IPL. The Australian summer schedule has been released. Can the Aussies finally break their series drought against India? We get the thoughts of Tim Payne. And we take a trip down memory lane with Aaron Finch and Pup. Nine years since that World Cup win. Not one, not two, but three former Australian captains. Let's go around the wicket. Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Around the Wicket. I'm Narrowly Meadows. Callum Ferguson and Aaron Finch back alongside me and we are celebrating the start of the Indian Premier League. Plenty of Aussies in action right throughout the tournament. So right throughout the tournament, we're going to keep you up to date on how they're faring. The batters and the bowlers, though, fair to say, even the all-rounders, Finchy, not starting all that well for the No, it's been, a, it's been a tough start for the Aussies over at the IPL, but it's only one game for a lot of teams, two for a few others. That's a short, very small sample size in T20 cricket. It's a brutal game at times. Obviously, the batters would love to be getting a, a few more runs, but uh, I think you can probably start to judge it a little bit more after four or five games. CSK overnight absolutely crushed the Gujarat Titans, so they are on top of the table with two wins. MSD still got it, but from an Aussie perspective, Spencer Johnson, he started OK for Gujarat. Yeah, it's great to see so many Aussies getting an opportunity, particularly a young bowler uh, for Australia like Spencer Johnson. The more opportunity he gets and exposure at such a high level is going to bode well for the Australian team going forward. But as you can see there, there's plenty of guys getting a run over there at the moment, which certainly helps Australia's cause going into a World Cup year. World Cup in June in the West Indies and the USA. We'll talk about those Mitchell Stark figures for KKR. He broke the record with his price tag. And Michael Clark is going to give us his thoughts on just the pressure that that puts on a star. But speaking of stars dealing well with pressure, how about Virat Kohli? He's leading the orange cap after a couple of games, which is the leading run scorer in the Indian Premier League. 98 runs and an average of 49, a strike rate of 142, opening the batting for RCB. You were a teammate of his. You know him really well. You've captained against him. After two months off, he's come back with a starring performance. Yeah, it's no surprise either. I think once you get in the roller coaster of international cricket and domestic franchises like the IPL, you can just get into the mode of playing non-stop all throughout the year. So I think for Virat Kohli, the two-month break that he's had, and he even said it himself, the ability to go away where nobody recognised him and he was just able to be himself and, and live his life as if it was uh, a normal everyday life because you can't underestimate in India, if, whether you're an Australian player or an Indian player in particular, just going about your day-to-day -day life can be really difficult at times in terms of uh, just getting out of your house and, and finding time for yourself. So I'm not surprised that he will come back uh, fresh and recharged, ready to go, and, and looking to have a huge impact, not on just, just the IPL, but the World Cup coming up too. A player of the match performance, he said after it with a wry smile on his face, I guess I still got it, even <laughs> though his name has only been involved with promoting the game at the moment. So a little bit of a dig from Vera there with a smile <laughs> on his face. There have been some conversations. Is he an automatic inclusion in India's 11 for the World Cup? What do you think, Ferg? Oh, he absolutely is. And, and you've only got to look at the way he's managed big games in big tournaments in the last two or three years to almost suggest he's one of their most important players. So he's in that side for mine. Uh, lock him away. And going on about the way he's come back into it over the last couple of games, Darren Lehman used to always say best when fresh, particularly towards the back end of your career. Mm. No doubt that's worked for Virat this time round. And hopefully he can use it as a launching pad going into the World Cup. I can't understand why every time there's an ICC event coming up, in any format, people always talk about Virat Kohli, is he under pressure for his spot? That is the biggest load of rubbish I've <laughs> ever heard in my life. He is the greatest player that I've ever seen in, in white ball cricket. And it doesn't matter that he strikes at 140 and there's guys who strike at 160. If I'm, if I'm picking a team, you're picking a guy who you know day in, day out, and like Ferg said, in big games gets the job done. So just ludicrous that we keep having this conversation. And yeah, I'm with you because sometimes I reckon those strike rates can be skewed because he'll play to get the W and make yes. sure there's no risk involved in getting there at the back end, particularly with the tail. He'll make sure of that. And sometimes 
He, his uh, strike rate may be sacrificed a little bit, but he gets the wins for his team. You say fresh is best. I feel like chip on the shoulder can sometimes Absolutely. be best yeah. with champions <laughs> like Virat Kohli. Speaking of champions, the Aussie women are in Bangladesh at the moment. The third ODI is being played today. They've got uh, T20s to come. Of course, it's a T20 World Cup in Bangladesh later this year. So this series is really important. They're creaming them at the moment. What do you think, Finchie, as preparation goes for the World Cup? I think it's great preparation just being in the country, playing in the conditions. Because whether you're in the subcontinent, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they're all slightly different surfaces. Yes, they're all a bit slower, they all spin a bit, but they all have different characteristics. So I think the preparation for Australia, in fact, Sophie Molyneux is getting the job done as well. Oh, yeah. Great to see her back and, and performing so well. That's a real big positive for Australia, I think. And you think it's potentially a positive for Bangladesh, even though they're losing comprehensively? Yeah, look, we've seen some some sides really struggle uh, in the women's game over the last few years, but make giant strides on the back of copping a few hidings like this. And and I think we'll see them bounce back really quickly on the just the experience of playing against such a high-level side like Australia. They'll learn their lessons. It'll be good for the women's game in the long run. Well, don't go anywhere on Around the Wicket because a former Aussie captain, Michael Clark, is going to be joining us next. And we're going to talk about the situation at the Mumbai Indians captaincy because Pup knows exactly what it's like to take over from a legend. Welcome back to Around the Wicket. Time to bring in one of our regulars now, Michael Clark, former Aussie skipper, is back with us on the show. He'll be heading over to India shortly to commentate on the Indian Premier League. Pup, great to have you back. Who do you think is the Aussie under most pressure this IPL? Uh, Thanks, guys. Nice to be back with you. Uh, I think all the overseas players are probably under pressure. Uh, That's generally the case um, in all competitions, but... Probably Mitchell Stark. Again, he hasn't played IPL for a long time. His price tag is what probably puts him under pressure, the most amount of pressure. I think any time you're getting paid um, the most amount of money in the team, there's a huge expectation. So I'd probably say Starkey. $4.4 million Australian, none for 53 in his first outing for Kolkata. Do you know what it's like to play under that sort of price tag? I mean, maybe not the $4.4 million, but... <laughs> he you... played in it every day, of his, every day of his career. He was getting paid that much. <laughs> I wish. Oh, look, I think... I, I don't think it's necessarily about the amount of money. I think you know as an overseas player that there's expectation. Um, and in the IPL, you can only have four overseas players. So you're always under pressure to perform. Otherwise, somebody else will take your spot. Um, and, yeah, like I say, if you're the highest paid in your team, then there's even more expectation that you're leading from the front and, and setting the example. So I don't necessarily think it's just about the number. Um, yeah, the amount of money will get spoken about in the media. But I think I think Starkey knows he's, you know, Opening bowler for Australia, all three formats, the formats had a lot of success. He knows he needs to perform because there's an expectation that, you know, KKR need him and he's he's probably their best. He's not just the most expensive player on the team. He's the most expensive player in history. Finchie, mm. you have had an experience where you felt the pressure of the price tag. Oh, absolutely. I think there's there was times in my career where you it's not the number that you're affected by it. It's the pressure that you put on yourself because you want to perform as well as anyone. And you, sometimes you feel like you have to justify it. So you, you tend to go away from your own plan every now and then because you, you didn't think that you just have to do something extraordinary. When the reason you get that in the first place is because you're a pretty good player and, yeah. and they, mm-hmm. they know what they're buying. So I always felt that that was a little bit of the case with me, that you just tried to go above and beyond and, and play maybe a game style that wasn't quite suited 100% to you. Now, Finchie, you're also going over to India for the IPL. The Mumbai captaincy is a fascinating situation that's unfolding at the moment. And social media lit up. Hardik Pandya goes to hug Rohit Sharma after the game and Rohit Sharma turns around and doesn't want the hug, put it that way. How how have you seen it and and what do you think is going on? Oh, I think that there's obviously something that's happened behind the scenes. And a big part of uh, Hardik coming back to Mumbai Indians was the fact that he was going to be captain. And, I mean, when you've got the Indian captain still playing in the team, like, that is the highest pressure job in sport. Forget any other sport. I mean, it is just sport nonstop. There's something that's not adding up quite right there. And, and I don't think that anything that happens on the field it would be affected by it, but maybe there's just something niggly behind the scenes. 
Papa, you have an interesting insight into this because, of course, you took over from the Australian captaincy of Ricky Ponting, who we know is, is a legend of the game, a great of Australian sport. Can you give us an mm. insight into what that situation was like for you? Oh, I think it depends on the personality. I, I think I always felt comfortable uh, with Ricky still being a part of the team. When, when I took over the captaincy, I think the selectors at that time probably thought that his career was was going to be over and we had a conversation. And for me, I never felt I never felt uncomfortable, like I say, or intimidated or um, any different playing with Ricky as my captain or the other way around with Ricky staying a part of the team. And that was... That was something that I certainly wanted. I wanted him to keep playing. I, I think Ricky's leadership qualities were very important to the team at that time. He brought a lot to the team off the field as well as, you know, how everyone knew how good a player he was. Um, so I think it really depends on the personality. But, yeah, you, you've got to be comfortable. I think I think it from both parties. I think, firstly, the new captain needs to probably sit with the old captain and, and have a conversation. You want that relationship to be to be a good one. Um, and you probably want the, the old captain helping the group. Um, and I was fortunate I had that. But if it doesn't go that way, if the captaincy's taken off you and given to someone, then, you know, it, it could be really difficult. There's no doubt about it. So I think both Rowett and Hardy, if Mumbai want to do well in this competition, like they always seem to do, they're going to need both those two players. They're going to need them both playing well. And they're probably going to need both leaderships. You know, Hardik's going to need Rowett's leadership and experience and knowledge because he's the most successful IPL captain. Um, so I think it'd be silly not to use that and embrace that. And then Rowett, hopefully, he hasn't got beef uh, and he's willing to to put the team first and do what's best for, for Mumbai and for Hardik. Pup, did you ever feel as though when you took over the captaincy under, or with Punna still playing in the side, did you ever think it, it affected any of your decision-making at on the ground? Did you ever think... Is what would Punter do in this situation, or what is he going to think about the decision I'm about to make? No, I didn't, mate. No, and, and like I say, I, I think I, I think I'm quite a strong character. So sometimes that's my my greatest weakness as well. I was I was very stuck in my ways. I felt like I had a a style of of captaining, and and I stuck to that. Uh, I definitely went to Punter for advice or help or get his opinion. Uh, I think more than anything, a lot of the time it was around conditions, the pitch, uh, even selection. I'd use his advice there. And again, his cricket brain's phenomenal. So I think you'd be silly not, silly not to, but he never made me feel uncomfortable. And like I say, I think my character, I, I sort of just backed my gut and went with it. And you do, you know what it's like as a captain. You speak to your vice captain, you speak to your coach, other senior players. I think that was probably the most important, making punter feel a part of that. Uh, and well, I, I guess, you know, you need that as well. You, you like having other people to throw things off, bounce so, things off. Sorry, Pub, just on that. So did you feel like you had to bring Punter in in that time as well? I don't. I don't, didn't feel like I needed to. I wanted to. Yeah. I wanted to for, for the team. I thought it was in the best interest of the team that he still feels a, a leader in the group, a part of that. Um, and I wanted to get the best out of him. And, and that's one of the things that Ricky offered the team at that time. Some people bowl, some people bat and bowl. Ricky batted, fielded, and was a, was a great captain. So, you know, I think I, I would have been silly not to have taken that knowledge or used that knowledge. And he was open to it, you know. He didn't, he wasn't, I don't, I, I never felt like he was angry that he was no longer captain or, you know, I think he saw that was the stage of his career and he's going to play a bit of a, a mentor role to a lot of the younger players and and help, you know, the current captain, me at the time, uh, any way he could. Uh, to another former Australian captain, Steve Smith is over there working as an expert um, analysis, basically. Does this come across a little odd to you, Puck? It does, Nez, to me. Only because, well, I see both sides. I, I think it's probably very smart by Smith. He didn't get picked up in the, in the auction. So he's probably thinking, if I'm in India, someone gets injured, they can drag me straight in. Very smart. But I find it uh, just a little interesting with the stage of his career he's at, the fact that he's over there commentating or working in studio. But he definitely has made it clear he wants to still be a part of the T20 World Cup. And I don't know how easy that would be for him, the fact that he's watching other players play and he would still want to be out there. So I'm sure at times that's going to be frustrating for him. Um, unless he's got to a stage where he's decided that his time 
in T20 cricket, certainly with Australia, he's up, which I don't think he's made that announcement. I'd imagine he still wants to be a part of that World Cup campaign. So, yeah, I don't know. I just find it, um, I find it interesting that he's sort of, you know, after you play, well, you look at us three guys, uh, you go into commentary or working on cricket and things like that, but very rarely do you see it happening when guys are still playing. Yeah, not into a, a full, you know, sort of contract of a whole tournament like that. It's almost like you're redirecting somewhat and it just felt a little bit awkward yeah. seeing him there because I, I feel like he's still got plenty of good T20 cricket ahead of him. He's still looking to go to the World Cup. So it just had a bit of a weird feel to it. I would have felt a bit uncomfortable in that situation myself personally. Mm. Your thoughts? Oh, I, I, I found it a little bit odd because I, I felt as a – but he's only there two weeks, remember that. So he's not there for the entire yeah, tournament. Yeah, so yeah. I think it, it's actually a good way for him to stay in touch with the T20 game after yes. not having played a lot of it over the last couple of months in particular. So it's a good opportunity for him to see it up close and personal. And probably, like Pup said, get that, that real hunger back for it again and, and make another run at the – Aussie T20 squad. Now, Steve Smith was also part of a special team that uh, two out of three of you played in, and that was the 2015 Cricket World Cup. It was an extraordinary event to cover, and this Friday marks nine years since Pup, you led the way. Finchie, you were the opening batter. MCG final up against New Zealand, and you managed to you know, take on all that pressure of hosting a home World Cup and win it. And for me, it is covering it was, I think, one of the most underrated performances from an Australian sporting team because it came off the back of all of you going through the loss of your great mate, Hughesy, Philip Hughes. Pup, what are your memories of that World Cup and where does it rank for you? Oh, so many amazing memories, apart from you reminding me that it was nine years ago. It makes me feel <laughs> old. Um, Blonde hair is great. My God, where... It- where is time gone, honestly? Um, oh, look, it's, it's as special a moment in my career as I had. Uh, and, and uh, you know, winning in 2007 was, was no different as well. I, you know, I, I think we had a, an awesome team. I think the way the, all the guys performed was, was unbelievable. To be able to captain that team, I was so fortunate. Uh, so much talent and young um, ultra positive talent as well. Like it, I, 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 my memories really are the bigger the stage, the better we played. It was like all the boys in that in that team wanted quarter final, semi final, final, wanted a bigger crowd, wanted more pressure. We just, I don't know. I think we embraced the playing at home. I think we embraced the being favourites. Um, I don't think we feared losing. You know, maybe losing to New Zealand gave us a bit of a kick up the backside just to to make it very clear that we had to be at our best if we wanted to dominate and win. Um, and it was probably the best thing for us. But, yeah, I don't know. It was an unbelievable tournament and and everyone contributed in some way. Even, you know, guys that weren't playing all the games um, played a, a significant role in that sort of 12 months leading up to that World Cup. I'm very happy that you <laughs> mentioned the New Zealand game, Pup, because the one thing that I remember about that, we, we almost dragged a win out of... Nowhere, we're, we're done and dusted yeah. in the game. But you gave one of the greatest yeah. sprays I've received as a player to the whole entire group post game, and 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 the reasons oh. for it were, were pretty simple. As a group, and like you said, young, energetic players mm. who, who back their skills. We turned up to Eden Garden or Eden Park rather in New Zealand and saw the, the how small the ground was, and for the weeks lead up to that game. Blokes were just trying to hit sixes every ball. We're like, wow, yeah. the ground's so small. We'll miss hit them. They'll go for six and. We come out and we yeah. played a game style similar to that and it didn't pay off and the skipper wasn't happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got to say, I don't remember that spray, but I probably gave so many and copped so many over my time. I'm happy I don't remember it. But, oh, yeah, look, you'd, well, I think you've all been in, in leadership roles. Um, it, it's never nice when you underperform. And that was that's the thing about that team. I, look, okay, one game we underperformed, but... Throughout that tournament, we just, I don't know, somebody found a way to stand up and, and win us the game, whether it was with the bat or with the ball. Um, and there was a really good feel in that group. You know, I think I think everyone was excited by looking around and seeing so much talent, but also all of us playing well together. One day we will get one of those sprays on around the wicket, I reckon, and I look <laughs> forward to it. No, no way. No <laughs> Thanks so way. much. They're, lo- they're long gone. <laughs> forward to chatting to you from India. Don't go anywhere because the former Aussie skippers just keep on coming on Around the Wicket. Tim Payne is up next.
Welcome back to Around the Wicket. The schedule for next summer has been released. The first test of a five-test series against India will start on November 22. Bringing in former Aussie skipper Tim Payne with us now. Payne, great to have you back on the show. I'm sorry to bring it up, but you led two series losses at home against India, which means that the Aussies haven't been in India in a test series, yes, the World Test Championship final, since... 2014, 2015. That means it's a decade. How tough is it yeah. and how will Pat Cummins find it, do you think? Uh, it's been tough, no doubt about that. I think Paddy's got the group that can get it done. I love the fact that we're starting in Perth, which doesn't give the Indian batters time to acclimatise to the bounce. However, in the last 10 years since they have been beating us, the major difference in Indian cricket has been the depth of their pace bowlers. So our batters are also going to have their hands Full with Bumrah, uh, Mohammed Shami, uh, Siraj. They've got a, a beer, really nice group of fast bowlers now, which is different to what they've had in the past and they'll challenge us. But um, I think it's advantage Australia with the first three tests being Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane. I think that sits nicely with the Aussies. How tough is it when you're the captain and you're losing at home? Can you give us a bit of an insight? Yeah, it's difficult. Certainly um, when India aren't at full strength either, uh, that stung a little bit, but... Um, you know, we were unlucky. We were sort of part of the rise of, of Richard Pant um, and he sort of was a guy who just came out and played basketball before basketball, can you believe? <laughs> so uh, he came out and, and took us on and, and put us on the back foot. Um, and to be honest, I think that was something that Nathan Lyon, uh, Mitchell Stark, Pat Cummins, Josh Hazelwood, they've never had that happen to them before and we hadn't as a team. So uh, he was one of the key factors in that, um, as well as I said, their pace bowling stocks have certainly... Mm. Uh, improved in the last decade and they're now a real handful to beat outside of India as well as inside of India. Another great highlight of this schedule is the women's side of things. The Ashes, there's going to be a test at the MCG in the women's side of the game since 1949. It'll be the first time. It's it's great, isn't it? And I'd love to see a big crowd there. Oh, it'd be great. I think the women's game deserves it and I think what a, the Australian cricket team has done to transform cricket in, in the women's space. They've been the benchmark for so many years now and, and it'll be a great spectacle and I hope it, like you said, I hope it gets a huge crowd and they, they do it justice. Painy over in the IPL, your former coach, Finchie, your former coach, Justin Langer, is leading the way for LSG. It hasn't started smoothly. The first game was a pretty comprehensive loss. We know he had issues at the helm of Australia. It's very public. How do you think he's going to go in the India system? Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see because there's there's two parts of jail which I think are going to be the two keys to it. One is he's really passionate and Indian cricketers and cricket fans love cricket as much as JL. So I think that's going to be a huge plus for him. The one that he's going to have to watch is his intensity. Um, it was much publicised um, around the Australian setup, and that's the way JL is. It's can he manage the individuals um, in the Indian setup or in the Lucknow setup um, to get the best out of them. Uh, as I said, he, he can be a super intense character and that's also one of his strengths. Uh, it's not something that traditionally you would put with Indian cricket teams. They're really laid back the way they go about it. So it's going to be fascinating to watch. Um, and if he can manage those individuals who want more intensity and, and lay off the guys who don't, I think he can have success. As I said, we know he loves the game of cricket uh, and the Indians will love that about him. Especially over such a long IPL campaign, it's really crucial that you get the balance right. And because there's ebbs and flows, there's times when you might play four games in eight days and, and you just need to get into the game mode and you just need to keep ticking off game after game. So, so that'll be a really int interesting challenge. And I think the other part that goes with it is the private ownership. And, and I think that that's something that people probably overlook at times when you're talking about IPL. Is It's one thing to play for a state team in Australia or the Australian team or an international team, wherever it is. But once you've got private owners who... Uh, it can be quite demanding at times on what they want from their players and from their coaching staff and, and the admin staff. It, it, it adds just another layer of it. So it'll be really interesting watch over the next eight or nine weeks. The other thing for JL as well is he's so used to having a team for a long period of time, yeah. over 12 months, whether it's at state level or with the Australian team. He's now bringing you know, 20 individual franchises, really, if you look at it that way, into a team. Guys that are playing franchise cricket you know, throughout the year... From jumping from team to team, how does he bring those guys in and cater for everyone? It's not just one in, all in. Mm -hmm. It's actually bringing everyone together and making sure everyone feels comfortable in the environment. That's an entirely different beast altogether. Let's see how it pans out. 
Payne, another name that you've already mentioned, your babysitter, Rishab Punt. It was one of the great scenes in the first week of the IPL, watching him walk out to the middle with a standing ovation, had a, a stumping and a catch as well, keeping in this IPL. Did it put a smile on your face to see your little mate back out there after everything that he's been through? Yeah, it certainly did. There's, you know, there's a lot been said about the ordeal he went through and how close he was to, to even losing a leg. So I thought... Just to see him walk back out on the field, for me as a, as a cricket fan and as a fan of Rishabh Pant, we had our banter back and forth, but a lot of it was really cheeky and good fun and um, always enjoyed having a chat to him off the field, enjoyed when he was out playing. As I said, he played cricket how I always wanted to. I didn't have the courage to take the game on or the skill <laughs> like he did. So I certainly appreciate what he brings to the game um, and to see him back out there doing it and the joy he brings uh, to Indian cricket fans and fans all around the world. I can't wait to... Keep watching him and hopefully, um, you know, he can be fit enough and well enough that he's on Australian shores come next summer. Well said, Tim Payne. Thank you so much for joining us again on Around the Wicket. We look forward to having you a part of the team right throughout 2024. Don't go anywhere, though, because these two blokes are back to take on their favourite segment, and that is the short stuff. Time for the short stuff. And what about the luscious mane from MS Dhoni? Oh, oh he's <laughs> still it. got it behind the stumps and he's still got it, Ferg. That is a luscious mane, isn't it? It's glorious. That is unbelievable. He's getting better and better with age, MSD. <laughs> the Pakistan players, the international players, are about to do a two-week boot camp, army style. Have you ever done anything like it, Ferg? Oh, Wayne Phillips put us through a 48-hour boot camp with the uh, Woodside Barracks a few, few years back. And honestly... Both set to close, wet through after about 12 hours, going to sleep for half an hour, gunfire in the trees around us from speakers tied up to trunks of trees. It was chaos. No fun whatsoever. Nothing good can come from it. Two weeks isn't long enough to, for a full fitness camp. And all that can happen is one of your premier players gets injured. Yep. I just remember those Warney stories from back in the yeah, day no, as well. Yeah, no uh, WA <laughs> completes the three-peat in the Sheffield Shield. How about Cooper Connolly on Shield debut, mm. 90? How good is this kid going to be? 20 years of age. Combine that with his feats in the Big Bash final a couple yes. of years ago, he's, he's going to be a super player. He's got all the talent in the world. Make sure you join us next week. We continue right throughout the IPL. See you then.